Hi, I'm Alex Mosed. You're here on Winner Take All evening session. And uh, we're, what we talk about on the show is basically the constant back and forth between large tech monopolies and the traditional incumbents and just try to make sense of where all this stuff is landing. So on the in- incumbent side, bad news for uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, they are increasing their estimate uh, of number of store closures which is up 20 store closures from their prior estimate of 40 store closures, uh, which they had estimated back in April. Five, six months later, they're saying, oh, we're going to increase that by 50%. Um, We just were talking about Forever 21 going bankrupt, uh, the seventh largest tenant of Simon, the largest mall company in the United States, and how they were closing hundreds of stores, uh, but they couldn't get out of all these leases. And so bankruptcy is enabling them to get out of the leases. The company will still be around. And they actually just got additional financing based on their bankruptcy plan, which will then enable them to get out of these leases that they weren't previously able to get out of. So um, Bed Bath & Beyond is not going bankrupt, but they are increasing their number of store closures. We've talked about this multiple, multiple times. We've shown you the stats on just how much more retail square footage there is per capita in the United States compared to just about any other country that has a reasonable metric, we are an order of magnitude greater than everyone else. And so this is just inevitable. The store closures need to come down. The, not even just the store closures, the amount of real estate that these stores take up in a given uh, mall or property needs to shrink. Um, And that can be very difficult. That can be difficult for the landlord or the property owner um, and for a variety of things. One thing that we have potentially seen are for companies um, like a Walmart, for example, that you hear them now coupling the retail store with a fulfillment center. And so you'd say, well, why would they do that? Why would they use more expensive per square footage priced real estate that had traditionally been a retail store? Why would they want to convert that to a warehouse? And what you're seeing is, not in every scenario, but in some scenarios, where um, if you can use the warehouse more efficiently, so let's say you have 100,000 square feet, and you say, you know what, maybe I'll shrink the retail part of the store down to 50,000 square feet. Maybe historically, I could fit 200,000 products, SKUs, stock keeping units, into a 100,000 square foot place. I'm just kind of making up the numbers here for the sake of the example. If I go down to 50,000 um, square feet, maybe I can have 100,000 products and SKUs. But in the 50,000 square feet of converted warehouse space, maybe I could store 300,000 SKUs. So net net, I'm actually doubling the number of products or the array of inventory at that one location. Um, Because I get much more efficient usage of the space in a warehousing dynamic. And why is this useful? Because what you see Walmart and a lot of these uh, retailers doing is really pushing for the pickup and store option. That's one of the biggest reasons that Walmart has been able to beat on their digital e-commerce growth is because they're letting you buy groceries online and pick up in store. And so that's a big deal. And so I think a lot of these retailers maybe have a little bit more ability to invest in these kinds of new growth initiatives like a Walmart um, or maybe a Home Depot can start to think about maybe it makes sense in certain locations to um, shrink retail, but then add on warehousing to get that larger product dynamic, more kind of dynamic inventory set up at the location that people can then come pick up in store with a wider variety of things. And maybe you get incremental sales in the store, or maybe you're just, you're just winning that customer over because you're giving them a convenient option. So we'll see what happens there. Amazon also has some bad news where now, now the Washington Post is on to them and saying, Amazon sellers say online retail giant is trying to help itself, not consumers. You know, maybe they're watching this show because someone on this show has been talking about this for a long, long time. This is the real place that tech monopolies are vulnerable to be considered an an, an actual antitrust threat, an actual 
anti-competitive force in in the industries that they're in. And this is exactly uh, what we've been talking about. So they say here, this one fellow, he has a store on Amazon. His account got hacked and um, he didn't pay $5,000 a month for the primo service from Amazon. And so he was never able to really talk to someone. He was never able to get you know, Amazon to fully kind of review and vet what really happened on his account. And he had nowhere else to turn. Basically, is he going to pay $60,000 a year for premium support? He's got a smaller store. His account got hacked. His, his account got penalized as a result of that. And no one could really get to the bottom of it. So, the, so this is exactly what we're talking about where, well, actually, we've talked about more egregious cases. This one's honestly kind of like light hitting. I don't know. It's okay. It's an okay example. Whoever wrote this, what you should do is go find the product manager's emails where they're cutting the third-party sellers out from underneath them by getting the purchase order and going directly to the manufacturer. So now that, you know, then the question is, oh, well, Amazon doesn't, you know, Amazon only has, uh, what do they say? 10% of of US retail, right? Two and a half trillion dollars of retail. Amazon's doing $277 billion in GMV. Um, you know, Amazon only has 10%. Well, so this is the way you need to look at it and think about it. And basically, here. So this is really crude numbers. Let me zoom in here. There's Amazon, 160 billion. What does that represent? That represents the 58% that Jeff Bezos disclosed of the $277 billion in GMV, which they have attributed to third-party sellers. So that's $160 billion. eBay um, does about 90 or $95 billion in, um, in total GMV globally. And I think about $35 billion comes from the US, not including auto sales, I'm pretty sure. So $35 billion. We've guesstimated Walmart at $20 billion. They have not disclosed this number. This is a guesstimate. Goat, StockX, they claim that they'll be doing a billion dollars in GMV pro forma going forward. This is not, so this is a generous, they've not done a billion dollars historically in GMV. Farfetch has, that was 2018. I think they did about 1.3, $1.4 billion in GMV, but they're based out of the UK. I don't know how much of that is really in the US. And then I, let's say there's $10 billion in other. So if you are selling stuff on marketplaces, you're a third-party seller, and your business is to sell stuff online, would you say Amazon's a monopoly by these numbers? 70% of a potential $230 billion market of where you can sell stuff online as a 3P third-party seller. It's 70%. And I think these are actually somewhat generous numbers. So, yeah, I'd say Amazon's definitely a monopoly. And this is where people get it wrong because they're looking at the monopoly conversation through the eyes of the consumer. They need to look at things through the eyes of the producer. In Amazon's case, that's the seller. In YouTube's case, that's the content creator. In Uber's case, that's the driver. And when you start to say, how many outlets do the producers have? How many channels? Do the producers have to go and sell their stuff, whether it's their time and car for Uber, whether it's their content for YouTube? And then you look at how much those platforms control those respective demand channels in those industries. And you will find what? A winner take all dynamic and one or two dominant players, and usually one that has at least 60, 70% market share, which I guarantee you'll see the same thing for YouTube. Who does YouTube compete with? Right, Twitch is doing live streaming. It's different. YouTube's trying to do live streaming, but you could also look at where do you go to do live streaming, and Twitch is absolutely the dominant player in live streaming. So, you know, very often if you are the tech monopoly, what you try to do is conflate that your industry is actually much broader. Like Amazon says, well, we only control ten percent of retail, right? And then other people will say, well, Amazon doesn't even have fifty percent of e-commerce. But they're looking at this through the lens of the consumer, not the producer. When you look at industry classifications based on the producer, and you say you are a website like Yelp or TripAdvisor, and where does the majority of your search traffic come from? 
at least 70% is Google. So it starts to become much clearer when you consider the producer a customer, when you say who is actually paying Amazon. Oh, the third party seller is paying 10 to 20% of the product they sold as a 3P third party seller. Guess who? To Amazon. The app developer on iOS is paying 30% to who? Apple. YouTube, the content creator is paying 45% of ad revenue to guess who? YouTube. When you start to look at the relationship of a producer as a customer, paying money actually as a customer to the platform, producers are customers. And when you look at producers and who monopolizes the channel for the producer, this stuff gets much clearer. And that I think is, I think that's the biggest discrepancy people have, or certainly regulators have, or, or the media has when trying to have this whole kind of like tech is bad conversation is they look at it through the eyes of the consumer and what they're missing, Lena Khan, same thing. They're missing that platforms have two customers, a consumer and a producer. And when you look at it through the eyes of the producer, it all starts to make sense. It all starts to make sense. Same thing for Microsoft in the nineties, same thing. They got in trouble for Netscape and rigging the apps, which is what Android got in trouble with the EU in 2017. The dots all fall in line. So um, they're slowly starting to catch on. The Washington Post article was okay at best. MasterCard Vapor? Question mark. So MasterCard came out with this press release. I'm, I am, MasterCard is in Platt, by the way. They are a platform company. Been, it's actually one of the oldest platform companies. Um, interesting story on how MasterCard started. They actually started as a nonprofit many, many, many decades ago when there was rules about transferring money between banks across state lines. And so Visa and MasterCard were actually set up as nonprofits that the banks collaborated to then use them and their technology to transfer money across state lines. And that was the beginning of Visa and MasterCard. Fun, fun little story. They are B2B to B, B2B to C tech companies is how they both describe themselves. So MasterCard said, we're launching a digital sales platform for farmers. Very cool, by the way. In Africa, very similar to what a farmer's business network and an Indigo are in the US, both unicorn companies, both platform companies, both helping to connect a farmer with an end customer, as well as some of them more aggressively on like seeds and the supplies going into the farm and giving you intelligence about you know, what you should be growing and how you should be harvesting and what you should be pricing your goods at. Um, but the Cargills, the um, ADMs, Archer Daniel Midlands, the Bungies of the world, they are the traditional kind of B2B distributors of agriculture goods. Um, and they're in a lot of trouble because I think the report is that grain can touch six to seven different hands between the farmer and the buyer. And every hand that that grain touches, they've got to take their cut. Highly inefficient process. And the grain can be stored for years in the grain uh, silos, right? So it's not actually, you would kind of think that this thing has um, a short half-life and it's going to expire if you don't get it to the customer. Not true. You can store this stuff for a long time. Um, which means that basically um, the marketplace model works extremely well. And I would actually argue that some of the biggest homegrown kind of startup B2B marketplaces that we see are in ag, in Indigo and Farmers Business Network. So those are very interesting plays. This is a play for Africa. Now, MasterCard and Rabobank are partnering to offer a digital platform to 1 million farmers in emerging markets. MasterCard Farmer Network contributes to this by offering a digital platform that makes it safer and simpler for small farmer, smallholder farmers to grow their business through close collaborations with important partners as Rabobank. Da, 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 da. Basically, what they're saying is they've connected 250,000 farms in Uganda, Tanzania, and India, and the solution connects farmers with buyers through a common digital infrastructure. Sounds very similar, right? Um, here's the problem. I have searched just about everywhere to actually find this thing. When you Google MasterCard Farmer Network, nothing comes up. There's no website. I can't find it. Okay. I go here, the MasterCard website, catalyzing underserved micro business, right? We're rolling this thing out. We're helping all these underserved farmers, which is great by the way, and much needed. My problem is 
You know, I click download now. I get a PDF. So they have 1 million targeted registered farmers. They're with 250K. You know, here's the solution. Here's some case studies. Great. Where is the app? Where is the website for the business? I cannot find it. I found this article from years ago, which says that this thing used to be called 2K, 2, 2 Kuzi, um, and, and this is, and it kind of looks like a text messaging app thing, but, and then they reference MasterCard Labs for financial inclusion. I love the initiative. It sounds amazing. I want to support it. I can't find it. And this, I think, is the problem. Again, MasterCard isn't, they're a platform company, but they're definitely much older uh, than, than, you know, the, the latest platform tech companies that are. And, and I think this is the problem when you think about incumbents, if you consider Microsoft an incumbent and you say, oh, they launched this press release that talks about reaching a million people and all this kind of stuff. And then you're kind of like, well, where is it? And why can't I Google it? And why am I five, six, seven articles deep on Google and I can't find the homepage? And you keep bringing me back to MasterCard. Like, give me the website. Give me a Squarespace template website that says, here's the business and here's a link to download the Android app. And if you're not in Africa, you can't get the Android app. Fine. I'm a happy camper. And it looks like a separate, independent, autonomous business. But this to me, and if, it, and if anyone out there that's watching can send me the link, I would love to correct myself and then, you know, update this information because I would love to support this initiative and it's a great initiative. Problem is I can't find anything on it. And this is what gives incumbents a bad rep when you do these big press releases and then you can't actually find the thing that's supposed to be big. I mean, 250,000 active users, that's big. You'd think you'd have a website that I could easily find on Google. So hopefully I'm wrong. I want to be wrong. So someone, help me be wrong. No surprise, social media. Now LeapFrog's print as the third largest ad channel. So what's ahead of print? Google search. I mean, I mean it's search. It's basically just Google search. And uh, TV ads. And now so social media advertising is the number three ad channel. Um, no surprise there. Uh, they're saying it grew 20%. It's reached, it's, it now has reached $84 billion in social media ad spend. Um, growth will slow to 17%. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's basically just advertising on Facebook and Instagram and um, Reddit now. We're, we've been talking about um, TikTok, part of the largest private tech company, Chinese company, ByteDance in the world. Um, a lot of money going into social media spend. So, not surprised, surprised on this one. Paid search will exceed $100 billion this year, reaching $107 billion. And one company basically gets 80 plus percent of all that money. Um, so, Match Group, we had a couple, couple companies in the ETF get some nice pops today. Uh, Match Group had two upgrades, up about 5% today. And basically, they said the, the stock was muted too aggressively because people were scared of the Facebook threat getting into dating. They haven't seen it be as impactful as maybe people thought it was going to be. And so it's still very strong. They put that back to a buy. Uber. Man, everyone's favorite company to trash. We have been supporting Uber. We've been said, I'm, I'm long on Uber. I think Uber's got platform conglomerate status and a lot of advantages against Lyft um, in locking in these network effects and so on and so forth. So Citigroup upgraded to a buy on Uber. Um, here's the interesting thing, right? These analysts, they get special access to public companies. They get special access to the CFO and sometimes the CEO. So they have the definition of insider knowledge. And so when this analyst from Citigroup is, is, is upgrading Uber to a buy, it means that he is meeting with the company and he's seeing their data. And so what he's saying is that it seems like 
they're be able to control costs and they have good growth, basically. So this was interesting at the end of the article. So they estimated range of GMV from 65 to $67 billion. Very interesting. So let's go back to our handy dandy little quarterly report from Uber. And here is their GMV in 2019, 14.65, 15.75, right? So they're basically around, you know, 31, 31 and a half and change, let's just say. Okay, that's interesting. So um, that means that in order for them to get to, what do they say, 65 to 67, that means you're going to have to see, you're going to have to see, you know, I don't know, at least 17 billion in GMV in, in Q3, maybe 18 or so in Q4. That's going to be, those are going to be considerable jumps. If they just, if they just add $1 billion in GMV each quarter, they don't get to 65 if you just do the math. They don't get there. So they need to add more than a billion dollars a quarter in GMV. I mean, that's a, a considerable increase in growth um, if they're going to hit that range. So, and guess what happens when platform companies show growth? Stock goes up, 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 up. Because that's really all these... It, that's the main thing investors are looking at growth. So it'll be interesting to see if they can actually hit that, that range 65 for 2019, this thing's going up for sure. Okay. Last topic. PayPal is one of the founding, you know, funders and sponsors of Libra. I don't understand. I mean, to me, this is competitive to PayPal. To me, you know, PayPal has is is kind of like a digital bank. They are lending. Um, they are uh, doing a lot of things in this arena. To me, this is something that kind of like why wasn't PayPal doing this? You know, this seemed like them kind of asleep at the wheel here. Okay, so PayPal, you may have heard, is now stepping out of the Libra Consortium. They had been in it. It pledged I don't know ten million bucks, nothing that big, and. Um, this is what we spoke about. When was this? This was this was episode four. This was in July. And I think PayPal reluctantly joined the Libra Consortium. They don't want to be left out. But Dan Shulman, I believe he's the CEO of PayPal. I, I bet you Dan saw this as a miss. I bet you Dan was like, mm, why don't we do this? I would say that PayPal stepping out of this, I think PayPal watches. I think PayPal keeps a very close eye on what Facebook is doing. I think PayPal tries to do something competitive to Facebook. This just isn't to me PayPal saying, oh, Facebook, you know, you're messing up the regulatory stuff. There's too much heat on this from the regulators. You know, I don't want to be involved. I think that's their formal public reason. I think deep down, they're grumpy that they didn't do this. And this is a good way for them to get out of it and help to kind of scuttle Facebook's initiative. And maybe they can, you know, that'll hurt Facebook's ability to do this. And then PayPal can... Uh, can finagle their own way into this. It just doesn't make sense why Facebook does Libra and PayPal doesn't figure it out. So I think PayPal is going to be back in this own, they're launching their own crypto in some way or another. And I'm sure they're probably chirping to the other people who joined up into Libra to also drop out. I don't know how truthful they are with these other partners to say, oh, well, you know, you, know, you shouldn't trust Facebook, da, 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 da. Um, Nothing material has changed in the past three months. What did you know now that you didn't know two and a half, three months ago when you joined this? What, that Facebook's going to get flack because everyone teams up on them for privacy and they shouldn't do a crypto? How is any of this new and, uh, and that you couldn't have predicted this? No, I think it's gotten, there's been enough 
uh, temperature and this guy it's gotten hot enough that Dan and the team at PayPal are finally able to say, okay, let's use this as an excuse. Let's try to um, scuttle this initiative from Facebook and maybe we can go to the regulators and say, well, do, you know, we'll do this ourselves and we can be trusted because we're a regulated entity and yada, yada, yada. There's something like that going on here. There's no way PayPal is done and, and not getting back into this game. So that's it for today on Winner Take All. Actually, this evening on Winner Take All. We will talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us.